The job of a sound designer is to trick you. Hey there, I'm just some dude on the internet, and chances are, if you've played Half-Life, Portal, Doom, Celeste, Mario, or pretty much any game ever, you've been tricked, bamboozled, hoodwinked, and swindled by a sound designer. That's right. Turns out punching demons doesn't actually sound like that. I checked. But in all seriousness, there's a lot of stuff in games that doesn't really sound quite right when you look at it more closely. And the question arises, why fake it? Well, reality is pretty boring. Like, I wish doors in real life could sound like the ones in Celeste. There's a lot to be gained from faking a sound or replacing it with something with a little more oomph. It could accentuate big gameplay moments, make actions feel more snappy, or instill a certain feeling in the player. And chances are, you won't even notice it. As a prime example, let's take a look at Half-Life 2. If you've played it, you've broken a box or two. But what I want to focus on is the way the sound is processed. Take a listen. Obviously, breaking wood doesn't make this weird high-pitched noise. But in the game, it doesn't feel out of place because of the context. Honestly, they sound more like cracking ice than splintering wood. But by making the sound more sharp and compressing it, Kelly Bailey, Half-Life 2's composer and sound designer, made a pretty normal game action feel a lot more impactful and snappy. And this stays consistent across the whole game. Another example is mounting turrets. Listen to this. What exactly does this sound correlate to? There doesn't seem to be an animation or anything to match the sound, but yet it totally fits and adds a bit of flair. The point is, nothing in this game sounds realistic when you scrutinize it, but it sounds like what you wish it sounded like in real life. But the best part of being a sound designer is figuring out the sounds for stuff that doesn't exist, like head crabs, demons, weird eyeball monsters, and Russians. I am Father Grigori. <laughs> for example, what is a giant levitating platform supposed to sound like? Or a floating door? Or dark matter? Or the sound after you collect these coins? Should it sound like a doorbell? Why not? That's the beauty of it. It can be pretty much whatever you want to be. Now you do have to be careful though. Sorry to pick on you, the Outer Worlds, but come on. Why does this laser rifle sound exactly like a dinky little pistol? But I digress. When I talk about what a game sounds like, what I'm really talking about is sound identity. I touched on this a bit earlier when I talked about Half-Life 2. Everything in this world is grungy and dirty and scrappy, yet sort of futuristic. The game is very fast-paced, so every action should be really fast and hard-hitting. The goal of Half-Life 2 is to make it feel like you're this mad scientist fighting through hordes of aliens and weird sci-fi creatures, and it totally accomplishes that goal. When trying to create a sound profile for a game, you want every action to reflect the world and gameplay experience in some way. A great comparison is Portal 2. Though the world is still kind of dirty and grungy like Half-Life, it's a much slower paced game with a lot less action, and as such, the sound effects are softer sounding with longer tails, more low end, and overall less sharp waveforms or transients, without getting overly technical. Or take Celeste, for example, where movement is supposed to feel graceful and fluid, and so the sounds reflect that, using lots of higher pitched sounds like the tinkling of glass and the sounds that are lower pitched are almost always longer and softer sounding. Now the one exception to this in Celeste, in my opinion, are those eyeball monsters, which I believe have been deliberately chosen to sound different to the rest of the game's sound profile to instill a sense of unease in the player. And a lot of this starts way back in the menu. Of course, I'm ignoring the elephant in the room, music. For the purposes of this video, I wanted to keep the two separate, but when recording footage for Doom for this video with the music off, I discovered something really interesting, how empty it felt. Here are two clips of me playing through the same area, once with the music on and once with it off. These are kind of long, but I want to let these play just to highlight my point.
ravioli. Ah, mamma mia. Okay, so I did add in the music in the second clip. But you gotta admit, it's almost comical how low energy it feels in comparison. I realize that in Doom, the game is built around the music. It serves not only as a background, but also as a kind of pseudo-ambience, and has lots of choppy audio that fills in the emptied space. For a more extreme example, just check out these two clips of the intro sequence. Like, it really is just that more badass. And that just highlights another consideration that you have to make when figuring out a game's sound identity. Does the music take a backseat to the ambience and sound effects, or is it the main attraction? This can be fairly obvious with rhythm games like Guitar Hero, but for a game like Doom, I didn't expect it at all, but it totally works. So where am I even going with all of this? Well, I haven't posted anything in the past 10 months, and that's not just because I was lazy. But mainly I've been composing music and doing the sound design for a game called Threadbound. Link in description, go wishlist on Steam. And I had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out what the sound profile for the game was supposed to be. I wanted it to sound realistic, but also a bit cartoonish, which is a tricky balance to strike, especially in a pixelated 3D platformer, which is already pretty cartoony. And what I settled on was that the world around the player slash main character would sound more realistic, but every action that you took in the world would be cartoonish, contrasting the main character's naive nature with the dangerous environments in the world. Of course, that's all easier said than done, and one of the main problems I faced were that there were a lot of objects in game that I just flat out didn't have access to, like these moving platforms and big doors. And that's what brings us, finally, back to the main thesis of this video, that sound designers trick you. It's a bit of a necessary evil. Unless you've got a bit of a budget or have some connections, chances are you don't have access to the proper equipment that makes the actual noises you want. And even if you did, there's still the chance it wouldn't sound quite right in the recording. So that's where you have a choice. Either go to freesound.org and hope that someone has exactly the sound you want, or fake it and record it yourself. Let's go back to those two examples in Threadbound I brought up. This sound when the platform is moving? That's me scraping a brick across the ground. And the sound of a massive door opening? That is literally just me closing a metal desk drawer slowed down. And there's a lot more of this kind of thing in the game, but these are two really simple examples that make it easier to illustrate my point. But when all is said and done, yeah, they may not sound super great on their own, but just like every other example I've brought up, it's all about the context of the game world and how the developer chooses the environment and sound profile of their game. Whether it's realistic or not doesn't matter. If it sounds what you think it should sound like, that is what matters. So until I decide to make a video like this again, thanks for sticking around to hear me rant, and I'll see you around, partner. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we'll use that, we'll use that.